My, my podcast doesn't have a big fancy introduction. It just starts, so we started. So That's um, fine. thanks for being here, first of all. My pleasure. For people who might not know who you are, I, I uh, luckily do know and have known for a long time. Okay. Can you give a quick, um, I guess, background, where you come from, who you are? So, well, who I am? Where I come from a very Hasidic home. Um, I come from a uh, home of Satmar Hasidim. I grew up in Williamsburg. I was born in Israel. We left Israel in, um, when I was a very, when I was an infant. And we moved to Williamsburg, and that's where I grew up. And um, I was not involved with music um, until much, much later in my life. I um, began to write music by mistake. I was about 19 years old in London. <clears throat> And I was very fortunate that I met, a, who, I met someone who at the time was the greatest musical personality in the world at the time. There was nobody else besides for, for Rabbi Shlomo Kalbach, who I didn't really know at that time yet. I found out about Rabbi Shlomo Al Shalom way into my marriage. I had never seen him. I had never heard his songs. I never heard his albums. I didn't know what it was. I was in London and I met Yigal Salik. I was very fortunate that I met him. I met him because of a chesed that he did. I, I lived in, an, in, a, in, a, uh, in the attic by a relative in London. I learned in Schlesinger's at the time, in Stamford Hill. Um, and uh, I would come home at night. I don't know if anybody has been in London in the winter. It's, it's kind of, uh, it, it's not very, coming from where you come, from where I came from, it wasn't, it wasn't a very happening place. You could say it was miserable, if, if you want. Uh, it was much more than miserable. Okay. But uh, <laughs> I'm just just, ki just kidding. There are some wonderful people in Stanford Hill, and there always will be, and there were there were then. But at the time, I the person that I was with, that I was at the um, in in the uh, in London, in Stanford Hill, where I lived in the attic. The uh, she was my aunt, my aunt and my mm -hmm. uncle. My aunt kind of had the sense that I was lonely at night. So she made the following phone call to Yigal Salik, who at the time was like, as I said before, to me, he was the greatest Jewish, the greatest music personality. And um, she said to him, look, I have a nephew here from New York. And he learns in yeshiva, he comes over at night. I, I, I don't think he's, I think he's kind of unhappy at night. And I think he's, tell, I think he's probably musical. Is there any way, would you, would you come out, would you meet him? So he says, sure, give me your address. He jumped into his car and he drove over to my house, to the house that I was living in. And um, my aunt said, Yossi, there's somebody here who's here to see you. And I came downstairs and Yigal was at the door. How old are you? Did you say I 19? was 19. Um, oh. 97. So yeah, I was 19. 18. It was just turning 19. And he says, you want to go for a ride? And he took me into his car and we became very, very good friends. Fast forward to um, the next point in my in my life um, he had just uh, Yigal was doing huge concerts in America at the time what a huge concert means it's hard for people to understand they used to use Brooklyn College at the time he would come with London, the London School of Jewish Song on let's say on a Hanukkah and it was he, Matzah Shabbos Sunday night the following Matzah Shabbos the following Sunday night everything all four shows were sold out completely mm -hmm. and it wasn't two and a half thousand seats because that was before the fire they had the fire rules so what they used to do is they used to pack people in to the seats and then fill up the aisles. I mean, today forget about right, it. You couldn't do that. And it was, and and he was a huge star. And one and and he did a few of these. I didn't even at the time. I didn't even know what a concert meant. Well, I didn't know what is a concert. I have no. I had no idea. I've ne I'd never seen a concert. Yeah. I'd definitely never seen a Jewish kids with a concert with music and arrangement. None of it was all Greek yeah. to me. And he had done a. Um, he had signed a contract with the producers over here for the coming year on the condition that he brings new songs. Because at that time, I mean, he was writing beautiful songs and so on, but every, every, every composer goes through a time where sometimes it gets, it's called the writer's block or whatever. He must have had some writer's block because one of those times that he came to pick me up, I saw that he was sitting in, he was sitting in one of these comfortable chairs and he wasn't so, and he says to me, you know, Yassi, if only you would write songs, all my problems would be solved. Did you never try? Because you're a musical guy. Did you never try to, 
to write it. I mean, everybody has one song in him. I said, look, I live in an attic. And in the attic, there's an old piano, which has, you know, the piano keys look like, you know, they're right. like this. But there were a couple of working, there were a couple of working um, intervals. Okay. And I was able to bang out an interval, which became Kol Baroma, which is Kol Baroma Nishma, which was my first song. I can tell you when Yigal heard the, he heard the melody, it, it was like a fairy tale because until then it was like a, we were both kidding around. And as soon as he heard it, I turned it around and I banged out the key with the, the keys with one finger. And he jumped out of that that and he ran to the to this farm shank, took out a Parshas Vachi. He knew the word. I had no idea. I was just I had a melody. Yeah. He opened up Parshas Vachi to Vaani Bivoy Mipalana Ram Rashi has called Baram and Ishman. He says again. And I and I did it again. He said, again, he's screaming, do it again. Do it again. And and that's how our first song. And then he says to me, Yossi, wow. we have it. We are going to go to America. We're going to make concerts. I said, what are you doing? What are you doing? You'll see. You'll see. It's it's great. It's great fun. It's anyway. That was wow. the. Uh, yes. One second. So that was the kind of a period where you were like hanging out with him, but you hadn't even like as a friend. You Exac hadn't... Exactly. That was the Kiddush. To me, wow. I was enamored because, first of all, our the conversation was great. He was. I mean, he was he was a, he was a London Stamford Hill person. Nothing to talk about, but he was the most exciting London Stamford Hill person that I had ever met at the time. And he was he spoke my my language, and I was fascinated with him. And he had this beautiful taste. His compositions were very European. Were very, I mean, Padav Nafsh. I mean, today you play it today, it's a dream. Right. Or Shimum Halachim. That's how I wanted to ask you that. What, what is it specifically about those compositions that there's obviously incredible, incredible songs, incredible writers, and and really beautiful music. But there was something in that music which, I mean, obviously I grew up with, but I, I, I haven't heard anything similar like that. Is it a geographical thing? Is it a time thing? It's a number of things. Well, first of all, at the time, you know, people asked me how I was fortunate to be able to write the body of material that I wrote, and I explained. To, to many people that I was born in the late 50s, which is about 10 years after the Holocaust. Jews were not singing at that time. This is something that people don't understand. Yidin were not singing. I mean, they were they were crying. And they, in, in shul, every, every, um, every song was a sad song. And then there were old songs. And nobody, there were people, most of the people in shul had numbers on their arms. So, and... I was there at the beginning when Klali, I always, I always say it, when Klali Israel began to sing, I was fortunate. Yeah. They started singing and I was right there at the beginning. And um, whether it was Rav Shloyma that began at the time or whether it was the first Pichai record, the second Pichai record, there was, there was um, Rav Sender Mendlowitz, who was um, one of the guys who wrote magnificent songs in the beginning and so on. So... It was a combination of Europe, European, so back to Yigal. So it was, so he, the world was very into Mashiach because Yidin had gone through such a horrific event. The exit strategy of Klal Yisrael was Mashiach. Every plan that we made was if Mashiach doesn't come, we'll go to camp. If Mashiach doesn't come, on Purim will be dressed like a soldier. Yeah, we were sure Mashiach was coming. We were, we, and we were always afraid and we would feel guilty that if he would make a long-term plan and it wouldn't include Mashiach and it, wow. we, almost, we almost felt like we we're doing something wrong. So everything was about Mashiach and every we all knew that that the only, uh, how were we going to deal with what the tragedy that happened, which was so huge in, in Klal Yisrael. So we knew, well, this is, it must be. And Israel was happening at the time. And, and there were all kinds of, he snagged us to Israel. And we all knew one thing. If Mashiach comes, it'll all be, it'll all be solved. And Yigal brought Messianic from Tanakh. He brought Messianic passages from Tanakh. Shimon Melochim or Manavu Alahorim or it's all if you look at it, it's always about the fact that Mashiach is coming, that that Klal Yisrael is waiting any minute now. Mashmi Ashalaim, Vasir Toiv, Elyonov is coming, you know. And so there was a combination of this beautiful uh, European cosmopolitan type of uh, melodic sure. music. Also, the world was a melodic world. The, the there is a um, in Yiddish there's a there is a statement that says, that the way the Goyim, if the Goyim are edel in the world, mm -hmm. then the Eden are edel. If Khalil has the Goyim become less edel, then... So if the music is good, 
By, like we're influenced by what's happening around yes, us. Yes, it's, it's, we're not Khalilah influenced totally, but we don't come up with new paradigms. We kind of follow, f- follow the older paradigm. So in answer to your question, it's a long answer to this question, but it needed a bit of a background. Sure. So there's Tanakh, there is, there is, there is Yigal, there is also Russian Jewry. We were all, we grew up, there was, there was a millions of, of people locked up in Russia who wanted to be, and every, all our counselors, our leaders, our madrichim, they would always explain to us how lucky we are that we can practice Judaism, and, mm-hmm. and they're locked up, and we always knew, dear, my, dear Nikolai, you know sure, that song, yeah, yeah. We read, where a kid writes a letter to his little kid friend in, in, in Russia, so there was Children of Silence, what a song, I listened to Children of Silence yesterday, yeah. when will those curtains of this of despair in my heart be broken, be torn away? Those chains, when will those curtains of loneliness part? I mean, this is, he was talking about when are we going to have the Yeshua ready? And that, and, that was, and I worked with the melody and it was, you know, and, and, and there was no formula. That was the other thing. Yigal did not have to follow somebody else's formula. There was no formula. There was no part A, part B, bridge. Right. Shimu Melachim. Hazinu. It changes to three. Changes to four. Nobody told him this is a song in four, it's a song in three. What are you doing? He just, just did it. Exactly. You can correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like, um, especially based on what you said, it, it kind of seems like as a, as a collective and as a, as a people in that time period, the music was very much coming from a very um, real. When I say real, I mean it, it was after a very dark time for the Jewish people. And that was very much reflected in the music, whether it was through the hope or the sadness or writing a song, uh, Dear Nikolai, or whatever it was. I feel like today, there's almost this, um, I don't know if it's a fear or a non-acceptance on a community level of people, people not being able to be real and sing about real things and the way they really, really feel. First of all, do you agree with that? Well, <laughs> that's, that's a very loaded, Loaded question. If you want to jump from that time to this time, it's it's you have to do it in stages because today, okay. first of all, there in those days there was one yigal in the entire world. Any Jewish child that wanted to listen to Jewish music, you had to listen to London School of Jewish Song. Okay. If you wanted to go to any concert in the world, they were the only ones. MBD wasn't even there then. It was still called Mordechai Wordiger. At yeah. a at a London School of Jewish Song Concert. That's where he became Mordechai ben David. I was there. Oh, so, so they, so they were really so the was, first in the world. It wasn't they were the first in London. They were. They were exactly. They were the first in the, the concept of Frum Jewish. He was a Frum guy, uh, kind of a Rebbe, but very. And he danced and he sang and he. Yeah, he was cool. Uh, on stage, it was. He was alive on stage right. and and uh, he he carried the hopes and the dreams of everybody. And from there, slowly. Solo singers, uh, many times I mean, and somebody asked me, tell me what makes Mordechai, what makes him so great? So one of the things that occurred to me as the years went by is that until Mordechai came along, the person who, who sang at the front of the room sang with his talus to the, to, to the, to the audience. The, f- what the first person from person to turn around with his microphone to face an audience was Mordechai ben David. Mm. You know, it's like, it's unbelievable. It's yeah. like, you know, we take it for granted. A guy comes up, stands on stage, and he said, no, that's not the way Doesn't it works. Right. You know, I'm not talking about Yasser Rosenblatt uh, when he did Chazan Isha concerts. I'm talking about when we saw a star, we saw the back. Right. Suddenly we have, and, and movement, and, and, and rhythm, and, right. uh, you know, so. And lights and screens. So, right, yeah, so. And and so there was a time when Mor- when when an album would come out, if, if Mordechai put out an album, one one I'm talking about Mordechai because Avram, Avram Fried is, is still a young child at this point, you know. Right. Whatever album they put out, there was no formula, which means if you listen to the first few albums of of, of MBD, he's a great composer, by the way. He wrote most of his own songs. Again, no formula. Uh, you know, he has an album that starts with Ve'koil Hachayim Yoiducha. No formula. Nobody's going to tell right. him, oh, you're going to start with that kind of a song. You need uh, kiloitos. You need, again, so 
whatever, Klal Yisrael was so excited that there was somebody coming out with Jewish music, we all ran to buy the album. Pirchei came out with an album, we all ran to buy the album. Right. You know, now, if you want to jump, I'm, I'm, I'm asking to, to jump with you to the front. Okay. But just to tell you one thing, today, you have hundreds of people that are singing. There are literally hundreds of people with a microphone facing an audience and singing. And their audience is fragmented. It's no longer a universal audience. So you have everybody. If you see one of the younger people, like a uh, Mordechai Shapiro or a um, Shmili Unger or whatever, if they managed, that means they're great because they managed to get more of the fragmented audience together. to come together. But to say that they have that, to, Avram, to, for somebody to become an Avram Fried or Mordechai ben David or Dedi or to today right. is, it'll take a little doing and so a lot of brachas. Okay, I, I guess I want to. Um, I'm sorry, you understand? That's why I couldn't answer what. what for, for sure, I, I, was, I, I, I needed to, to, to show you the difference in the markets. A hundred percent. I also yeah. want to be a bit more accurate with my question. Maybe even okay. forgetting the time period thing for okay. a second. If you listen to to mainstream music, I'm not I'm not talking about love songs, obviously, but. Mm -hmm. For the most part, singer-songwriters, they're writing about real stuff, things that happen to them, whether it's happy, whether it's sad. To me, it feels like in the religious world, there is a, a almost like a, a barrier whereby you're not allowed to be vulnerable and say, here's a song in my mother tongue that's about me, that's about something that happened to me. So basically your question is, the way I understand it, is the greatest genre of music, hands down, is singer-songwriter. What that means is a singer who, and he's a songwriter, and he writes a, he, he writes an honest, something, that, something honest about his life, and he manages to, to, to do a melody, and he sings it for the audience. Whether the audience can, can relate to the actual issue in his life or the actual happiness, it's not relevant what they're relating to is the emis. And we, we are very, I'm, I'm a, when I was, I always talk, I always talk about Yidin. Yidin are the greatest de truth detectives in the world. When, when, when they, they look at a singer singing and he's singing about a subject which they're not convinced that he knows what he's talking about, that he's singing it from the right place, they're not gonna buy it. You can have the greatest arrangements in the world, it's not gonna happen because Again, La Havdal, when you go to the singer-songwriter, you know that he's singing about something real. And so now, one of the reasons, going back to why we don't have many of those, is because there's a certain sneers that we always had, which, which, which meant that the, 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 the areas where we could, you know, the areas that relate to love, the, the areas that relate to, to, you know, strife, family strive, God forbid, or, or raising a child or not raising a child. These have always been uh, areas that, that we, these are areas that we work on and we work on them privately and we work on them through Svarim or through, through, through Rabbanim or through great um, people that are professionals in that area. So when we have an issue, we don't take the issue and tell the whole world here, this is my problem. Can anybody relate? So we, we didn't do that. It's happening more and more, obviously. And that's why more of those singer-songwriters are, and they're finding their way here to Mendy uh, Portnoy yeah. to do their, because uh, they know that he's very, you're very open to that, obviously. But that's the reason now. But Avram Fried and Mordechai Ben David and some of these guys, and I'm, I'm speaking to them about the two of them because that's where I started. Sure. Not to negate, there is some, yeah, yeah. there is such great singing going on now, it's unbelievable even though those two are the, the Rebbe's, no, no question about it. When they, I wrote a song for Avram called Tanya. I'll give, you, I'll give you an example. Tanya is a story of Rabbi Shmuel ben Elisha who went into the Kutcher Kodeshim on Yom Kippur. Mm -hmm. Every, here's a kind of his job is to go in, to bring the Ketairis, we know the whole story, the whole Avoida. Once he walked in, it says, he walks in and he sees the presence in, in, in Kutcher Kodeshim and God is there, whatever he saw. Akasrikel, Ka, Shem, Tzavukais. And, and God says to me, you're a Kayan. Give me a bracha. I, I want a bracha also. Which, which was, which whoever, every, if, if you sing that properly and you relate that 
everybody's there. You don't need singer songwriter. You don't need you don't need at that point to know the singer's personal life because if the singer if he feels that story that look at this Hakadosh Baruch Hu asks Rabbi Shmuel Kain Gadol for a blessing. Bless me, you're a kain. I gave you the power of blessing. Now give me a bracha. Forget it. And it shows the, the blessing. And people ask me all over the years, what, I, what do I think? What was it? What was it? Was the fact that the, the, for, the, for maybe the first time, people connected to a singer who was sing- and a lyric of his, which was not a lyric, which was part of Tefillah, which, uh, which a lot of people don't know really what they're saying. They're saying it all th- since they're children. And, you know, sure. that was the reason. So there you had the saying, Adar Abba. That was the same story. You have a personal story where you have this Rabbi Elimelech, one of the greatest rabbis that ever existed, the Rebbe of all the of all the rabbis, and he talks about that that people should see as malas chaverenu v'loichesrainam. Some, you know, lashnahara and these things benod lachaver is something that seems to have been invented a hundred years ago. But here you have somebody who lived three hundred years ago and spoke about that. And everybody right, everybody wants to do the right thing. Everybody wants to have. Nobody wants to have bad feelings about her, about their friend. They and when they see it written, and they see that this this big tzaddik Rabbi Elimelech from the past is exhorting, find something good about them. Yes, we all got our junk. Let's you know. So that was so people connect to that. So so that was the best that we were able to do until now. So you it, you were essentially trying to find themes or messages that were already there, but saying, hold on, let's how can I guess through the through the melody and through for example, explain with, with the story. Avremel, which for him being a coin, right. right? That that was personal oh. for him. Bring that t- to the people and say, hey, there, there's ready stuff that's written that comes from our heritage. Right. Before you put your own problems out there, hold on a second. How about this? Either that, or going for, let's say, you know, Ashenim Chalim. In order to, for me to be inspired, I have to be inspired that the person that wants to sing about the real, about what he wants to sing about, that it's real, that he's not yeah. coming. G- give me, write me a hit song. That's the end of it. I'm, I'm done for the evening. Somebody says right. to me, write me a hit song. Uh, what's a hit song, right? Avramo g- gives me a call. G- g- understand this. The Ashenim Chalam Abir Gazan, he tells me, he says, I had a dream last night that Mashiach was here. And I'm sitting over there and, I'm, and, I'm, and then I wake up and it's, I couldn't believe it. And, I, and, and I'm looking at him and I'm saying, is this guy putting me on? He's like a younger, he's much younger than me. And I, don't ever, I never had a dream like that. I said, you actually had a dream like that? Tell me about it. He says, yeah. And, and, and the, the, the obvious were there and, and Mashiach was there with his crown. And, yeah. you know, I said, do me a favor. If that's the case, get yourself into your car. Come over here right now and write lyrics for me. Let me, let, let me, let me hear. Let me hear the dream. And he wrote it. And everybody who loves that song because they believe Avramel had that dream. Now, he's not relating some story that somebody had written about a dream from hundreds of years ago. It happened in Kronites, this dream, you know? So, again, that MS part, you can access it through a personal story about misery, or you can access it about a personal journey of a singer as he discovers the different beautiful texts in Klali's world that exist and so on, you understand? So, I guess my next question would then be, how, how, how do you react to it? How does it make you feel as someone who, obviously, you know, you hear music that comes out and there's, there's more and more of it that's, you know, it's becoming more and more accessible. But there's a huge amount of music where it's clearly people taking a siddha or, or a chumash, opening it, saying, okay, I'm not necessarily sure anyone's heard these words before. And saying, okay, well, you know, that's a Jewish song. I can't, I can't sing about anything personal, kind of stuck. Um, here's the next Ashrei, Ashrei Ashrei. It doesn't do anything to me, and it doesn't do anything to anybody else. I want to tell you something. The, this, this scenario that you just pointed out, obviously it's prevalent. It doesn't go anywhere. As I just told you before, that the Jewish neshama is the greatest, greatest de- truth detective around. If they hear somebody talking words, they will right away be able to figure out that where he's standing. I hundred percent. I have to, okay. You I have, disagree with me, which I, is I fine. I have to respect, and, I, and I'll tell you why. Don't, and it's, don't, it's, don't, don't be so respectful. It's fine. It's we also, have a disagreement. Okay. I say that a song like that, and if it comes out, it'll be out for a week, two weeks, three weeks. It'll never be played again. The, the one thing I'm always looking for is. I think what most people are looking for when they hear music is authenticity, whatever that means, whether it's through a personal story or a, an old text. You know, right. that, 
there's definitely stuff out there that if you go to if you go to a wedding that's been a hit for for years or if you go to an event if you go to a concert i do believe that there is something that just in a catchy melody that's given words that passed the kosher test that people eat up you could probably think of examples as well so you were respectful to me before i'll be respectful to you now okay. <laughs> it doesn't exist what you're talking about it's a fantasy it doesn't exist it doesn't there is no such a thing in my opinion of a Jewish song that becomes a hit. When I talk a hit, about a hit, I don't mean that you a couple of guys are dancing. And You're doing saying wedding. timeless. I'm timeless, exactly. Okay. Yes, of course. If you have somebody who's got a good band and so on, and the boys need something new to dance to, and the girls need something new, that goes up and goes down. So and I guess it's, I need it's gone. I need to be around for a few more years then to really to to come back to you on this because your, your career is. Um, it's so long, let me tell you it, where yeah. let me tell you where where we you differ, have those where songs we that differ. have been around for thirty years, right? But there's, and I'll tell you why. And I'll tell you where we differ. I never write a melody and go look for lyrics. Never. Okay. What what how what kind of melody? What's the melody about? Where am I writing, I'm writing a melody in the right. air? And then I'm going to start. You're saying what is it inspired? Or I'm going to walk right. around. Oh, I have w lyrics that are walking around with me. Let me see if the lyrics fit. Nonsense. There is always a lyric, always a text, which blows me away. And I'll go to the piano because I want to remember the text and I want to share the text and I want to, I want to scream it to the world. And the way I scream my text to the world, it's through a composition. I don't believe in the other thing that you say doesn't exist. Maybe, maybe in the beginning, maybe, maybe in the very beginning. But I look, but take a look. Look at my Rebbe. Look at look at Yigal Salik. It was all about the text. Right. It was always about the text. And his know? stuff is still around. What? And his stuff is still around. Yes, because, because that's the reason. Again, you, you may find uh, uh, somebody to copy the uh, Goyesha rhythm. It, uh, that's, not, we, that's, not about, that's not what a hit is. A hit is a song that people are singing and, they're, and they feel something and they get together at a kumzitz or whatever. And they Now, there are younger people who have younger feelings about various texts, and that's fine. Right. Which is the way it's supposed to be. You have a you have a guy like Natalie Kemper, right? Natalie Kemper is fabulous. You know, he has real he has real real feelings about what he writes about, and maybe he's not in he's not in the Tanya world, or uh, you know, he came in he he had a I'll give you an example. He came over to me the first time I met him. He came over to my house and he said to me, "Look, I have a lyric that I'm working with." for many years that I haven't achieved anything with it. I was looking forward to meeting you because I'd like you to, to compose the melody. I said, what's the lyric? I'd never heard that kind of, and he tells me, there's a letter that the Gra, the Vilna Gaon wrote. He wanted all his life to go to Israel. This was his dream in his life. And um, what he did was he set off from Vilna. He told his, his, his rabbits and he told his children that he's going. And as soon as he gets to Israel, he's gonna set up, he's gonna send for them. And, and he took off on a strip. On the way, he stopped somewhere, and he, for whatever reason, I guess he had to stop for a, ho in a hotel, motel, hotel, whatever. And he writes this letter to his family, how incredibly excited he is, and how thankful he is to God because he's on the way to the love of his of his world, Chemdas, the love of Kol Yisrael. I've been looking forward all for thousands of years. Everybody's dreaming, and he says, "I'm on the way. I'm I'm going there." You know. And sadly, he never made it. And he, he got sick and he went home and he, you know, and he brought it. It took me two minutes because Naftali Kemp is sitting and I'm looking at this young man and I'm saying, he really believes this. Right. He feels this, you know, and that's where the song comes from. And that feeling Not is the other contagious. Way. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's good. This song is called Chemdas Kalisrol. Billy Ainari, has a, it's a huge hit for him, you know, and it'll be around for, for, for years. Anytime that somebody's going to want to connect to that specific emotion of this, Big tzaddik, this big gun, and you see a personal, he had feelings also. Right. And he writes his wife, he says, I'm, I'm coming, I'm going to send for you, and I'm so excited that, I, that I'm going there. I mean, come on, that's right. like, wow, you know? You, you touched on something before, which I think is also, I guess, a, um, a, um, a, a level reading, a reading of whether something is a hit or not, um, which is, you know, you mentioned singing it at a kumzit, which to me essentially means, and, and this is like a, you know, any producer or, or songwriter will, will say this, that a good song or a real hit, when you strip away all the layers and you play with a guitar or a piano, stands, sure. stands its own. Sure. Um, 
and I think that's that's a big part of it. You know, a lot of these, a lot of these songs that I guess I'm thinking about now, you won't hear them in a stripped down concert because when you don't have a hundred levels, hundred layers of production, sure. it's, it's there's nothing there. And again, l listen, you're you're a producer, and I respect that, and and uh, we need people like you to elevate, not to not to fight with what we produce, sure. to elevate and so on, but but. Um, Jewish music is not about production. It's about a text which is interpreted through a melody, which has which is authentic. But the word authentic means that there is a connection between there's a there's a real organic, there's that word again, connection between between the melody and the lyric. And people are in it. Like like what, what a Kumsitz is basically is people get into a zone. They come there because they want to get into the zone. They want to get into this special zone, whatever. Either they want to have a havas chaverim, or they want to have their own. They want to be. They want to become devotional, whatever it is. And the song, if it does it for them, it it's it succeeded, and that's a hit. The fact that that there was a couple of dance steps, you know, everybody turned around to this end, and they turned around to that way, you know. I mean, come on. You need that also. I mean, that's, it's cute, but those things go up and down and up right. and down. But we're not talking, I don't, we don't discuss, uh, you know, I have a song called the Dabe, you know, the Dabe called yeah. The Dabe called So somebody told me something. So I got a, I got a call from somebody today from, from, uh, from Chicago. He's a rob over there. And he says that he just saw a shot on the Dabe Kulabe today that he just had to tell me. The, and he says that, you know what the Dabe Kulabe means? It means... It, the regular, the, the simple translation is the one who has this has everything. The one who doesn't have this, what does he have? And the Gemara is talking about das people that have that have wisdom. They have everything. If they don't have wisdom, what do they have? So he says that he showed me a sefer that says that's not what it says. It says that like this: there are two ways to succeed in going to Elam Haba and Gan Eden as a result of the Torah. Either you learn Torah or you support it. So he says, the Dabe, the one who has it, the, the Kulabe, if, if he has money, that is, he has, he has the stuff, he could still be Kulabe, he could be as, as, as just like the Talmud Chochem, that the Saskha is a vulnerable thing, they can have a 50 50 relationship. The Loy Dabe, ma, 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 what is it? If he doesn't even have this either, if he's not, he's not learning and he's not, he's not contributing, you know, so. This is fabulous. This is a Gemara that I have a song I wrote maybe 30, 30 some odd years ago. This happens every week. Right. They're still they're still darshaning. They're still showing me meaning in the text that we discussed. You know. So anyway, that's the. Um, I want to so take a. Sh I was, oh, sorry, but yeah, but it was respectful. I so, think we're being you know, pretty respectful. So I'm far. looking forward to that incredible song that you're talking about, which has zero no, it's, connection. It's very... which has a fantastic rhythm and. Come on, they're no, not going to go and say, you know, something, I feel so close to everybody I'm dancing with because of this song. It's right. bringing me into, a, that's not, you know. I want to take a sharp left turn. Go ahead. Because when you say... A right turn, a right turn. We'll take a right, okay. <laughs> He's, now he's just disagreeing for fun. No, no, no. no. I want to take a, a, a sharp right turn. Yeah. When you say Didabe, I just think congas. And I'll tell you why this ties into my question. Um, I'm curious how... Well, first of all, okay, two parts of the question. Number one, when you are writing the song, is there a specific arrangement or musical style that you're thinking about when you're writing? And then number two, um, how involved generally are you in the production and the musical development of the song once you finish writing it? Okay, so in the so let's start the very beginning, called Barama Days. New York School, London, London, Amodei Sheish, um, Mayor Sherman, um, Avram Fried, the very, very beginning, um, not at all. I basically was excited that people were using my, my, mm -hmm. my songs, and I was happy to get uh, Vizakeinu Lekawa. Wow. What's great about Vizakeinu, Vizakeinu is a song that I, it's, it's, a, it's a text that I say every Friday night. And most people did not know that this text existed. I'll tell you, you know, in Chabad, between Shalom Aleichem and Eishes Chayel, there's nothing in the Chabad's mirror. Right. 
So, Baruch Hashem today, everybody knows Vizakenu. So this was something, Vizakenu l'kabel Shabbos, m'tach roiv simcha, m'tach oishir v'chavayd, m'tach miyut avaynais. I mean, b'sein b'anu yedzer toiv, l'av d'cha b'emes. It's the most beautiful thing in the world. And so, I was not involved. So to me at that time, I loved the melody, I loved the lyric, I gave it over. I didn't even understand at the time that singing will have, that, that solo singing will have that kind of an impact that it wound, that it wound up. The third album by Mishraik Chazuchu, that's where it all changed. That's where I realized that, um, where we made, that's where we made a right turn, Abraham and I by Mishraik Chazuchu, where we realized that, that it's, we, we need to do more. We need, our songs have to tell stories. Our songs have to take, translate the feelings, the emotions that we have and give that. That authenticity that you're talking about that the singer-songwriter has when he's talking about, God forbid, a breakup or somebody's not well. Or, mm -hmm. We understood it because our life was around the text that we were our life was around our text. It was around okay. our smears. It was around our davening. It was around our learning. So it was very got, personal too. It wasn't just exactly. Us and and, the text. and was Akainu, I said, man, Abraham says, where are these lyrics? I said, seriously, come on over. And he came over, and we and you know, so that's when I got I got involved because until then, and and the only one at the time who was willing to let to let my involvement was Michael Alfred. Why was that? First of all, he was younger. Younger than me. So you have to understand, when we came into the business, the arranger was the super was the king. musical personality. Okay. And we were just used as fodder. You know, you got you to gotta have a song to arrange. So yeah. you got to have some poor guy there who's going to write a song. In oh, attic, you like the song? In London. Thank God I could now go ahead and then arrange right. something, you know, and that's where. So we got nothing, they got everything, and so on. That completely, completely, completely changed. It went from having no involvement to being totally involved. Now, as the, the, the world got bigger and the talent, there were so many more and more people, I could, couldn't be involved with everybody. Sure. So what they do do, they, they come to me, they tell me, could you, could you tell me what you, how, you, how would you play the song? So if the guy is smart and he understands that this is the source of the song, why go to somebody who has no idea where the, what the source is and have him dig up some, some new, some new sure. uh, palette over there? And, and so Baruch Hashem, at this point, when I play, I'm not a great piano player at all, but I can put across what was it that I felt when I wrote the melody. And the arranger, if he has Seichel, translate that he into... Know, exactly, he does that. And they, and they do that, and they're unbelievable. So that's where the input is. Because I'm not involved in the production and, you know, whatever they're going to spend, whatever money. Look, production is the, the longer you spend on it, the more you spend, the better it is. I mean, if you have somebody here and he gives you the time and he gives you a budget that you could work with, you can make him sound like a dream. Right. But if he doesn't, if he doesn't have that, if he doesn't have that or doesn't appreciate that, then it, it doesn't do anything. Right. Right. So, but at this point, I'm, I'm, very, I'm, involved. I'm very involved, but not to the point like when I was with, when I was really involved with Avramel and Daddy, because then I was on top of everything. Right. I, I still fight for every chord, though, because one of the things that the arrangers never respected was they thought that composition consisted of melody. They didn't realize that only a half a composition is melody. The other has half is harmony. They didn't and take if, it as a conscious decision. I have sophisticated knowledge of chords, and I know changes and mm -hmm. and and do dominance and subdominance, and I know how to move from. Do me, leave me alone with your dominance. Nobody's interested in the dominance. Okay, I, don't change a chord. Don't change the chord unless you have a good reason. And this is what happened. I got the relationship with with the great arrangers, and. Laufer would say, listen, I, saw, I heard your, your, your chord. Do me a favor. Please listen to this. Right. Wow, that's gorgeous. So he would add a, a suspension, which I didn't know in the beginning. And he would, he would add um, tension. And so we grew from each other. I, I grew from listening to his, what his knowledge was, and he grew from the melodies. But it was a conversation rather it was than, a, yes, rather than give me your melody. And... Today, it's all, it's all a conversation. Right. Somebody wants to take a song, leave the door, and... Uh, Goodbye, I got your song, yeah. leave me alone. That's what they want. Yeah. Are there any um, strong musical influences from outside of the Jewish world? That sure, you know, absolutely. I'd love to know about who Well, first of all, I grew, I, grew up, I grew up in a, in, a, in a house where you didn't listen to classical music. Okay. Classical music and the uh, American songbook. 
which are yeah. all Eden, Rogers and Hammerstein, yeah. Rogers and Hart, um, Lerner and Lowe, Kander and Ebb. These are all Eden, by the way, every one of them. You know, they, they're, yeah. The gift that we, we gave, that the Jewish world gave to American music is, is, and to European music. And, you know, so that's where we come from. We didn't, we didn't, that, I didn't listen to, to, to I didn't know a lot of Rup Shloyma before, right. before when I was a child. If I would have, I would have probably been writing different types of melodies, you know? So my melodies come from that world. I, I, I want to change, not sure. my, I said my melodies come from that okay. world. They don't come from that world, but my, 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 my upbringing and my, my, um, my introduction to music as a child was from the classical Influence and the world. musical world. Right. Yeah. Okay, this is a loaded one. You ready? He's been promising a loaded one. I'm waiting for that loaded question. Come on, give, give it your best shot, Mandy. <laughs> All right. What is Jewish music? Jewish music is a, Jew, a Jewish song, you mean? Jewish music? What is, nothing, what, what there's no mean? such thing as Jewish music. You mean Jewish song? What, a there's Jewish no song. such thing as Jewish music? What, what do you mean Jewish music? What, chords? I don't think there's a preference. You think, the, you think they in heaven they like better an F? to a G with a C. Wait a second, don't do that, don't do that. Change it around, not F, G, C, no. I'm not gonna do it that way. Or is there a certain rhythm, a certain, like I like to, to have eight beats in the bar, but I, if you're gonna put an accent on beat number three, not sure. No, you okay. think that, that, obviously, that's not Jewish music. A Jewish song is a song written by a Jewish person. One of the most fried, somebody once asked oh, me this question, I okay. said, if I know him, I know him. Giazman Golaschem would not have been written by a Jew. It would not be a Jewish song. I know him, I know him. What makes it Jewish is that I'm, a, I'm Jewish. Hold I'm on. Eid. So yes. Bob Dylan's songs, they're Jewish. They're Jewish songs. They're, yeah, but they're, they're, they're songs written by a person who's incredibly conflicted. Yeah, I mean, you can you can call them. It's written by Jew, but he's a person that had all kinds of. He went through all the all the religions, you know. When, when you so you, we're not we're not defining what a Jew is now. Are we, are we we're not discussing what a Jew. No, I'm, I'm not an I'm, authority on that. We're talking about a, a Jewish song. We're talking about so, Jewish songs in our world. You're not talking about. Um, well, in that case, you can say that that um, yeah, I'm, I'm, America, I'm globally, America the Beautiful say... is a Jewish song, but I don't mean that. You understand? I mean, if it's a... so, 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 I guess to to come back to the question, this this is you know we as people who are involved in the Jewish music industry, really, we're involved in a certain section of it. It's kind of the maybe you would call it uh, Jewish uh, popular music or or Hasidic. The people call it Hasidic music. There's many different labels to it. Um, I guess the reason I'm fascinated by it is because I think. Um, and this has been my experience so far speaking to different people, is that every single person I ask has a completely different answer. And I guess part of the reason might be that when you look at who we are as a people, we come from all over, we've been all over, and we bring different things with us along the way. So for example, when you say I'm listening to Jewish music versus someone who's made Aliyah from Morocco, he doesn't think Jewish music is what we think it is. Okay. So, is it is it really the person who writes it, or is it is it the intention behind it, or if a non-Jewish person writes a melody, like for example, like some of the things that we have in our in our community, and then someone puts Hebrew text to it, and it becomes a main, it becomes a staple. Is is that really a Jewish song? Is it so Jewish music? You're you're going between Jewish music and Jewish song. So first of all, let's, so, let's agree. I don't believe in any, such a thing called Jewish, Jewish music. music. Okay. Music is music. What's, what's Jewish about it? Wearing scissors, film. So our culture doesn't have its own music. No, what, no. Nus Nusach? Nusach is something, what's, what's that? It's music. That, that's not music. Nusach is a song. It's a song. What do you mean? Well, you could Nusach, you, you, could, you could take a Cholila Goish melody and put it on Nusach. Does that become Nusach? Sorry. If you take, no, no, that's not Nusach. Nusach is very specific, by the way. But even lots of Nusach is influenced by Bach and stuff. That's... Nothing wrong with, nothing wrong with, influence. what's wrong with influence? Influence is not the issue. The issue is not influence. L let's go back to the Jewish song. To me, it's about a Jewish song, not okay. a Jewish music. Jewish songs are arranged. They can be arranged 
and that depends on the on the on the the public what they're used to listening to. If you're gonna if you're going to take a Jewish song and you're gonna arrange it with with the Caribbean Caribbean flavors, let's say, and the the audience doesn't know what you're doing. They're not. They're, that wouldn't be. That would be folly. It wouldn't, yeah, the, it wouldn't sti- make sense. the style or genre you're saying doesn't define it. Right? No, not at all. As you remember, by the way, just for, for for a minute, your the first Shades of Green album. I was a little kid, and I remember thinking, like, you know, I was I was very young, but noticing how each track just felt different. Which up until that point, I didn't really know. Right. I was like, but well, these pseudo, are all words that I know. They were not right. real. I mean, okay, Shades of it, Jazz. Come on, that's jazz. It, but they were enough to feel comfortable, but also expose you to, to a new right. sound. Right. So shades of Middle East. So there was a kind. It was a Poogie kind of was a, my favorite, by the way. What? Sh- shades of Poogie. Poogie. Yeah. Well, Poogie is completely right. Jewish. I mean, uh, Danny Sanderson. I mean, right. You know, it's anyway. Yeah. But but um, again, so that that was. I'm doing another one now. I'm doing a third one now. Right. I did right. That, I did Hipsh. I'm doing one with with, with Israel. I'm again with with um, you know different. It just. What it is, it's basically, it's a style that we, we, we make up, we define together, Yisrael M and I, that this is, and then we, we, we will, we'll get Yaron Gershavsky, who comes along for the ride, for the fun of it, and, and he knows, he really knows every single genre. Right. And we'll, 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 we'll get him to do the piano rhythm until we get the sound that we think, that we feel, Sure. But that's just a um, okay. just a color. It's not real. Uh, it's about a Jewish song. Okay. So, in my opinion, again, I, I'm again I'm very opinionated because the only thing that I really have is my opinion. It's very interesting. Opinions is a very strange thing about opinions. They're very related to the person that has it. You can't have somebody else's opinion. Right. You know that, right? A lot of people think they can. Well, well, <laughs> they can listen to someone else's opinion. That's... Yeah, of course, but it's that person's opinion. Right. So, uh, so I'm just telling you that I'm answering you. Sometimes I sound very, like very, very definitive. Very, it's not. I don't think I'm right. This is you're asking me about how I feel. One hundred percent about how I feel about certain things, and I'm I'm responding. But genuinely curious. You know, we've done a, a few episodes of this so far, but even within those few people, you know, whether it's one person who grew up in Crown Heights, and for them, Jewish music is standing there as a child in the Sea of Hasidim, and hearing Chabad Nigunim. You know, and someone else immediately just said, Shlomo Kolbach. Like, that is what that means to them. So you, with your story and your opinion, is, is exactly what I'm looking for. Right. I, I have no, I don't believe there's a right answer. Right. I want to collect is, there everyone's... Is a, there is an, exactly an opinion. I think that's also what makes us who we are as a people, like, that, right. you know. Yeah, but I, but we, I, we can go even a step further. And the, the Jewish song is central to Yiddishkeit. It's the only, it's the only um, form of expression where you could be, you could do Torah, Avoida, and Gemilas Chasadim with with a Jewish song. You could learn, you could daven, and you could you could be, you do Chesed with it. It's right. an unbelievable. Wow. It's it's a big part of who we are. We don't have many things that are so that that, that gives us the ability. So broad. The, the cult, they're cultural and that allow us to 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 learn with and to. Devo- to be devotional, to daven with, and to and to make other people happy with, and it's all in that song. Sure. It's in- incredible. Think of, go back to the other songs that you were talking about, the non-Jewish songs. Tyra, pray with it, make somebody yeah. happy with it. But it comes out for, for a few well, months, or a f- yeah. And that person, person who's not well, wants to have a, Wants to connect to something bigger, larger than him, and wants to feel something. And what are you gonna, you're gonna play Jeremiah was a bullfrog, uh, you know, like what, you know? Right. So anyway, um, I I saw firsthand um, an unbelievable example of that at the Sherry Book concert in Madison Square Garden. Were you there? Sure. Um, and it was really truly unbelievable to see just the, the different kinds of Jews who were there. Um, you know, singing these songs from whether it was the Chabad and Zemiras or stuff from you know Rosh Hashanah and Kippur, but just in general, the fact that someone was able to, a musician, a singer was able to do something that I think so many community leaders wish they could do. You know, I saw Hasidim in the crowd, I saw secular Israelis, I saw everyone. They were all looking for the same thing. What is that? A little authenticity. Don't sell me something you don't believe in. 
I'm going to listen to you. He doesn't have a great voice. I mean, he doesn't. He's not. Um, he has this great energy. It's not. The, it's not his energy. It's not his voice. It's his authenticity. There's and and the fact that everybody who I'm talking about the people that built him, which is the Israeli audience, sure. they understand what he's talking about. It relates to them. Like the, he has this brilliant song called Seder Avoida, where you have, literally when I heard it, I saw a, a young man coming to the outside of my shul, looking in from the window and describing what he saw. In other words, he didn't go into the Marzer and said, okay, let me see what the Avoida is in the Marzer. That, that's not what he what he did. He he came at the song, mind, and he said, "Look, Rabbi I did this, and I didn't want to do this anymore." And I did, you know, it's incredible. All of a sudden, everybody who's been saying these words all the years and was begging for a little connection to it, he connected people to it. He is pure authenticity. Everything, even though, let's say Achila Lakel, right, which was written by. A tzaddik by by um, what by Rila Pele, who is like such Pele. a precious soul. I mean, the way he looks, the way he, the way he writes, the way he sings. The man never said any. He never put. He never strummed a, a single guitar strum with using a word that he didn't really mean. And I, I met him only once in my life, but it's so obvious. It's like you know. I'm telling you that Achil Lakel, where Yishai comes from. He doesn't come from that kind of a chilolokel. I don't even know what, I don't know if he's Sephardi, if it's in, in the master or... Right. But when he decided to sing a chilolokel, he sang it because he knew that he's got it and he understands it and that he can connect with it and he can share his connection to the words with the rest of the audience. So to me, it was obvious that everything we're talking about here is the answer. Because this was the most successful Jewish concert right. ever. I've been there from the beginning. The amount of people and uh, and so on, and and what I what you saw, I and then when Avraham he called up Avraham, I mean, I mean, it's unbelievable. I mean, first of all, what Avraham sounded like, oh my, that that's the voice, fine wine. That's the voice <laughs> and the connection and the uh, you know, which is, but and again, it was so clear here these two guys, but they were both standing together and they were both selling authenticity to the people. And, uh, you know, you, you were there and you understood all the lyrics to what yes. he was saying. If I had to guess, I could be way off. I would say maybe 50% of the people there probably didn't, yet still felt a huge sense of connection. How, how did that happen? Because that's what authenticity is. That's what, I was telling, that's what I was telling you before, that the Jewish soul, the Jewish neshama is the ultimate Balshan, detective for authenticity, for truth. I think it's the neshama rather than, it's, it's a feeling, it's not, not, not an intellectual. Not, um, it's beyond the words. It's beyond the words. It's, it's a shortcut. It's humble, it's, it, by the way, the same thing with some of the melodies. You think that everybody who's at a kumzitz, you think that, they're, that they understand every word that they're singing? No, of course not. It depends. There are young people who understand less. There are older people who understand more. But what they all know, what the common denominator is that there's this, this song comes from a from a true holy place for the idea of, of just making me feel connected and closer. And it doesn't matter anymore. That's, you're right. right. Ishai is proof of all of these things because most of the lyrics, like you said, you know, not understandable, but, but, right. but when a person says those lyrics with his voice and the way he says it, it doesn't matter. It's like the uh, one thing that they all know is when they feel something. Or not. Right. That's it. It's not like you know, a... you'll have when a mother when when you you look at a farm you look, you look at foreigners and you see a mother calming down a child that's crying and 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 you have no idea what she's saying and she's saying these foreign words. But you know exactly what you she's know saying. right away. You you just you, you can tell that this is this is there's a mother and a child over here. It's not relevant because right. that's exactly what it is. That's wow. what you felt over there. I am curious if you feel like the. Um, I guess the the current trend in Israel, you know, people like Yeshaya Hanan Ben Ari, and there's obviously Akiva. There's there's many of them. Um, first of all, how, if if at all, do you think that's um, I guess impacting what's happening over here? And personally, do you feel that does it make you want to change anything in your songwriting, or or feel that maybe there are different directions worth exploring based on current changes? So. 
I work. I work with Ishai. We're okay. we're collaborating, and it's it's very okay. interesting. Our our collaboration <clears throat> is very because I'm coming from my world, sure. and and um, the, what I would what I would what I am kind of asking from him is to take my text and to put in his his uptouch in my test. Uh, the my way text. are you saying the way he takes Sukkim and, and then adds in? N no, 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 not. No, I don't not want. Lyrically. I don't want to change. I want the okay. entire. I want my text. Okay. And I and I explained to him what I feel about the text, and he gets it right away. He knows we have a very, we have a great, a, okay. a great uh, um, communication, and and he says, so what do you, what is it that you want from me? I said, what I want from you is I want you to sing, take, sing, explain to me how you you see this text. Like you understood, say the Ravida. Don't give me that. I don't want the whole, I don't want the whole song. I want you to put in a passage, eight bars. What is your pshat? What is Yishai saying? How do you say it? That's the collaboration that I want from him. Will it do anything for It will not change anything with me because everybody has to know where their strength is, where they come from. To, to write Yishai, you have to be Yishai. Right. And you have to come from that world and you have to look in from the window, like I say. And I, when I say looking from the window, I don't mean looking in from the window, Khalila, that, that, uh, one, that one person is inside, one person is outside. I'm saying that when I look at Yishai's world, I'm looking in from the window. And when he looks at my world, he's looking in from the window. And I like to hear what he sees, sure. his perspective. And he would love to hear my perspective. And and my perspective remains. I'm not, I'm still doing what I'm doing. I'm in the middle of precious project called Tartamashma, where every single, there's not a single of those lyrics that you talked about where they took and they sure. picked and, uh, you know. It's, it's uh, for instance, I have, a, I'll give you an example of a, of a text that Semach Tzedek has a text that means if you knew power what a pasik the power of tilim, you wouldn't stop saying it. I never heard this this text. I saw the text. Uh, incredible. So and this, so we have a melody on that. So for instance, now you and I are working on a on a song which is a song written by 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 Reb Kleinim is Kalman, you know, Nashemi and Kamdomai from from the Warsaw ghetto who wrote this magnificent uh, passage. And I said to myself, I gotta, I gotta work with Mandy on this. Why? Because I, I see you as that Sadiq, by the way, that sweet yeah. Sadiq that who's you, not a, you and my mother. Who's today. not aware, who's not aware of himself. He's not aware of his because that's how that's how you that's how you come across. And he says that if you tried everything to be to become a better, better person and it doesn't work, why don't you just imagine that you're a Sadiq? And he goes on to to build it, and and you you come up to heaven, and 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 the Hashem Baruch comes with all the malachim, and they say, "Look who's arrived!" And look, you know, how could you not write a song about that, right? So that's my my thing now. That's my way of 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 uh, communicating something sure. authentic, something precious, without using language, which he has the power of 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 Hebrew, Lashon Kodesh, which is so big and strong and he owns it you know so he can communicate with that i communicate with melody it's amazing i guess how it almost puts um the extra i don't want to say pressure but emphasis on the melody because you really you really have to make that your own so that the message comes out absolutely in a personal way it's really which is I'm a do. melodist. I come from a melodic right. world, a non-production world, right. a melodic world where the melody had to stand on its own. You had to be able to take it with one finger and hit the piano and play the melody without anything, without any of the atmospherics and any of the lighting. It, right. in, in a way that... You know the story about the guy who was, was going on a blind date and he, he, he tells the story that he was preparing the lighting and then he had a backlight for dimension and then he had a small lied to pick out his baby blue eyes, and then he decided not to go on the date because he couldn't schlep the lights. You know, so that that kind of tells you how it is. You yeah. know, the melody has to be, has to stand by itself. You know? In a way, I feel like as amazing as, uh, you know, technology is and the things it allows us to do, it's also a big obstacle. And I, I find this myself that if, if I try and write a song um, in this room over there where there's a computer and lots of buttons and machines and plugins and sounds, it's, it's a huge distraction rather than actually the computer's off and I'll just go and sit at the piano. Um, but you have both, it's unbelievable. You have the ability, you have this, right. which is, this is my, 
<clears throat> this is my partner. I've been I've been with this for for so many Canada. years, you know. And 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 but you have everything else. You've got the this whole world. You understand. I don't know how you got that. I don't know where you got that from. It's fascinating. When I met you originally, and uh, you know, we did an album called PNS. But one second, we have to talk about the first time we ever met. I was 16. oh yeah, but then you're right. Yeah, but then are we going too far back? No, no okay. but that, that was. I didn't really get a sense of you at the yeah, time. Yeah. I was excited your name was Portnoy, right. and I was excited that you were Rabbi today, Joel Portnoy's son, and uh, because that was back to the London school the where I started. So your father was part of that world to me. So I, I guess the answer to that is it's it's from my, my father. I mean he. He went on to be a, an arranger and a conductor and um, before he became a rabbi. Really? Yeah. In fact, on the wall over there, the picture next to Reb Shlomo is him conducting in London somewhere. Amazing. Um, what kind of music did he conduct? I think they did like mainly like events. Well, he did, um, he did weddings, but he also did these big productions like in Wembley uh, in, in the arena. What, like would... what the popular Jewish popular music? Yeah, they would do like Jewish popular I see, music. I see. Mm -hmm. um, and they, back then, the big production shtick was they would drive a Rolls Royce onto the stage mm -hmm. and park it in front of the curtain, and the kids would just keep coming out the car. People right. were like, how did kids? Uh, um, the old but, Ringling Brothers uh, yeah. trick. <laughs> but, but, but to me, that's really also a, a um, you know, people talk about whether or not something like music can be genetic, and to me, it's so clear that it is because I, didn't, I never studied music, and I'm one of uh, nine kids. And music clearly just runs in our family. Like formal training was never a thing. Um, and I was never taught to arrange. But I, I remember being in, in my father's shul as a kid and sitting there on Shabbos being thoroughly bored until the singing would start. And then when it did, I would imagine all the... I was like, hold on, imagine if there were some strings there and imagine there would be this there. And, Interesting. I wasn't um, even aware that your father had yeah. a part in that part of you. But you're really... Can I know how you developed into... You really understand production, and uh, you know. I came when I came to you to do this song Sadik. I came for a very specific reason. I felt that there was something that you could just bring. There was a certain ethereal, in other words, ethereal. Sure. There was an, an ethereal quality that you could bring to this arrangement, which was uh, very, very critical to me. Is there a? Are there any trends, or is there a direction that you see? I'm, I'm nervous to say Jewish music now, but Jewish songs, or, or th this industry that that we're, that we're in, where where do you see it headed? Where are we going? I see it getting bigger and bigger all the time. And from from your from the end from your end, yes, <sighs> Hashem, there are more and more Eden. They need more music. They need more more. They need to be. They need more inspiration. They need more people. There are people that will only be inspired by certain singers and uh, they want nothing to do with me. And I understand them. They, as far as they're concerned, I speak a language that's foreign. They don't know what, I'm, what, I'm, what world I'm, I'm talking about. What, what do you mean by that? There are, the, when I speak about, about our, our um, whole childhood and the early marriage years being involved with Mashiach, I, I come, I mean, Satma Rebbe, Zuchus HaYugan Aleinu, his yard site was the Divri Oil recently. He would, he, would, he would say these incredible, beautiful speeches, the Torah's Friday night, and um, Shalashidas, and so on. And every, when he got to like five, ten minutes before the end, of the, we're talking about long, long, long yeah. speeches, the last ten minutes, all he would talk about is that he would say, Hashem is Baruch Yazar, Hashem is Baruch should help us that we should be zoiched, that we've waited for so long and we've gone through so much already and that that it's it's hard to imagine what a generation we had and what were and what and what was taken away from us and that we're we can only hope that that we're getting closer and so that's that's what my life was about it's very hard for younger people today to understand today it's more of a a style you know people talk about it we want mashiach now or or they don't really understand the feeling it's interesting to give you an idea my father told me that he had a grandfather he was a sweet man who had his coat and his uh, stick whatever his cane that he was an older man waiting by the door because he felt that it it, it you know, that's the kind of uh, animamin that he lived with you know we can't even imagine such a thing so 
today, you know, it's it's so where I'm I'm from a previous generation, and I, I I'm I'm definitely I'm supposed to continue and supposed to try to interpret that generation to the to the next generation and so on. So there's definitely going to be, and um, more singers, and there are great singers. There's some beautiful co uh, composers today who are getting it. They got it, right. and they they wipe me out. I, I listened and said, "Oh man, he nailed it! He nailed right. it! <laughs> he knew it! He understood it! He nailed it! It's precious, you know." And that's that's one. And I know that it's gonna it's gonna be around. It'll be around for a long, long time. So yes, that's. I, I think it's only going to get better and more prolific. I mean, Klali Sroll is growing. Klali Sroll is growing in leaps and bounds. You, they're going to need more music. They're going to need more songs. They're going to need more. Don't worry about it. Your business is uh, safe. Oh no, I wasn't asking you're, in terms of that. <laughs> you're um, safe. You're safe. Anyway. Um, yeah, it's a shame. One one final question because I know you also you've you've got to get going. Um, you've done something incredibly unique in that the. I don't know if you want to call them the, the mainstream Jewish world, um, as well as the the Hasidic world, the Hasidic world, are both both feel extremely connected to you and your music. Is that something that you consciously think about and try and do, or is it just happened? It just happened it, because it comes from because again, let, you're, let's say you're talking about Yiddish Nachas, right? We're doing the fifth album right now, so with ten in the last ten years, we've been working with we'll, we have. Leon Horror, five albums going to be out. We started working on album number five. They were the most successful albums we ever did. The last 25 years, I'm telling you, in sales. Because, first of all, the, the I don't like to call it the Hasidic world. It's the, the pure world, the world that does not allow um, the internet into the house until a child gets old enough to make a decision on his own when he goes to work, whether you know, but not to take away the bechira of a child and say, "Here, here's a smartphone. Take it and go." Mm -hmm. You know, don't you know? Let, so these these people, and um, they they need something entertaining and beautiful and real and you know. So that was a world that I felt was underserved. Not because I wanted to be successful or make money. I wanted to, I, I want them to have the most beautiful music that there is. The most beautiful melodies, the most exciting lyrics, you know, as you, you can see, you can hear the, the songs and, and um, Baruch Hashem, that, that, that's what it was. Now, it comes from a love for them. Now, I don't, that doesn't mean more to Hasidish, more than Yeshiva. It's the same, it's all, they're all the same to me. It's that world that, that doesn't go out to look for their entertainment. Elsewhere. Out there, you know, they want, and I believe our entertainment, the, anything that Rabbi Shalom created, he created for his COVID, which means that in music, there exists the power and the ability to make use of every modern accoutrement that there is to take our music to a level that it w would involve everybody in the right way and so on. So. Um, I, I I don't I don't cater to a specific market. I, I write a song and I Mayim Rabim Lo Yuchlu It's 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 gorgeous. It's great waters will not extinguish the love. What love? Ahavas Yisrael, Ahavas Atayra, Ahavas Hashem is Baruch. That is a universal message. What is um, that's not a, a super from message. That's a a a living existing yid message. You know. That's, right. uh, we love the Torah, we love Eden, we love God, and we love our families. And, you know, so these are the kind of things that I write about, hopefully. And the Rancham should help that I should be able to continue. Because every song that mm -hmm. I write, by the way, I worry, is there will, will there ever be another song? Always. Wow. It's not guaranteed. You know, it's... it's uh... All right, well, we could probably go on for hours. But okay. Maybe we'll have to do a part two. What do you say? I have no problem with it. You just make sure that anybody was still would, would would be interested and be listening because there's we'll no. We'll find out. We'll, how come you didn't ask me what my favorite song is? What my top <laughs> ten, my top ten Kalbach songs are? And my, uh, I mean, come on. Um, I really, really appreciate you coming and you know taking Thank the you. time. Thank you. It's for, always, uh, always a pleasure. I, I, I was a supporter of yours from the beginning. Thank I was you. a supporter of Yishai from the beginning. To me, in other words, whatever I can bring. Whatever I can bring with me from 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 Jewish music, the way I know it, 
and to hand it over and to let you guys run with it, that's my job. I feel that that is also, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a transition figure as well, sure. you know. I'm hoping that more of where we come from will, will stay. And if not, I'm open, I'm going to hear. We'll, we'll see, right. we'll see where it comes. But the text is critical though. Sure. You want to hit me with a with a with a great modern arrangement. I want to hear the text. I want to hear the singer. I want him. I want him to tell me something. Something that I'll believe. By the way, you did uh, something with um, with Green. It's really green. It's really green, and you sent me a couple of songs and so on. And he's younger, and and uh, the, the 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 compositions were more simple. But he touched me. There was something real about you know. It's 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 not so much where I where I come from, right. but but. But it's real. And I'm sure that people who heard it felt it. They felt it was real. And he's a real guy. You can see him. I, whenever I see him, I speak to him. I spent he's a lot of time with him during yeah. the album. And, and you saw that he's, yeah, he's, a, can... he's a real, the real thing. So he's, he's a Hasidish boy who is open. And uh, I couldn't get over it. I, I, and you managed to. It's great. That's what I do. <laughs> no, it's, it's, no, you didn't pull him. There, I, I tried to give him an opportunity to, to do him. To do him, yes, you did That's him. It, and, yeah. and, and he is now, he's, he's a, a definitely subject of, of interest for me. Right. Like, what's he doing next? And so sure. on. So, it's kind and of uh, Eli Melech uh, Blumstein, who is delicious. I mean, his songs, he's, uh, you know that I had a, um, I did a, uh, a songwriter's workshop. Okay. Twice, songwriters workshop one, songwriter workshop two, because a lot of people are always asking me for opinions, advice, and I said, you know what, let's forget about the advice. Let's get 12 people together. Oh. I think I asked Yossi Zweig at the time to get people together, people that had already written something that wanted to, that were interested in listening to me, not that I was the rabbi, but they felt that they could learn something from me. And we had 12 guys twice, and uh, Eli Melech was one of them. That's that. where I met him, Donnie Gross, Eli Melech, um, Schwab, Sure. Eli Schwab, I mean, these were, I'm thinking about who was the alumni, so to speak. Don't get upset at me, guys. Yeah, I love you all. You're all fantastic. You all have your own world. But they were, they were with me and they were working together. Right. And it was very, that's the last time I met him. Eli Mella? Eli Mella, yes. yes. Wow. All but right. I know he's doing, I, mean, you, they're, they're, I, I understand him and his brother, they're, they're yeah. revolutionizing the world. That's what we're, that's, that, thank you, Hashem. Amazing. That's thank you, Hashem. And, and, and beautiful stuff. Just, Keep trucking. Thanks, Yossi. Anyway.